Hello there girls and boys and welcome back to the Inner Sanctum, the place where I show you all of the tricks that I pull off daily, live in front of you. <laughs> yes, I kind of messed it up, I'm sorry about that, but it's kind of hard to keep up with everything I'm thinking and doing during this uh, strenuous period of my life. But before I go down the rabbit hole of bitching about everything that's happening right now with me, let me introduce you to the Stone Brave and it got to be said from time and beautiful Theorgami. Say hello to the girls and the boys. Hello girls and boys, that. how's it going? Looking I'm blurry. Back. I'm looking bl blurry. No, of course not. No, no. <laughs> we're, no we're actually uh, trying out some new stuff uh, as part of a rig and it looks that it's working look. effectively. Look at that. Beautiful. Somebody's switching <laughs> uh, randomly, but whatever. Look girls and boys, today as the title implies we're going to be discussing and we're going to be trying out some ideas when it comes to the use of special effects when mixing. And if you have an idea of what that uh, concept means, well, you know what, that you're in for a ride. But if you are still uh, tipping your toes into these muddy waters that we call music production, what uh, special effects refers to, first, it could be referring to time-based effects, which could be uh, reverbs, delays, and anything in between. But also, these could refer to modulation effects, such as univibe, chorus, micro pitch and so on and so forth and what's the whole point of this the idea and this is the big chungus so don't mess this up thank you Thiago. there you got it the importance of using correctly special effects it's in the sense of using them as a way to enhance the emotional experience uh, of the song and or the instrument or the performance based on the program on the material itself what do i mean by that you'll find out soon enough but in a nutshell it's basically using it to taste to either create something bigger to create something new or to use it in a super subtle fashion that it can only be felt not heard okay yeah it's already uh, basically big i said nothing uh, because war is peace. But let's get into it. <laughs> Welcome back, girls and boys, to Logic Pro X. In front of us, we got the product that we're going to use to discuss this particular topic. As a super quick reference in point, we got here uh, using the glorious color scheme that I like to use for every single one of my products on Logic, even on Mixbus. Speaking of which, stay tuned because we are going to have a huge extravaganza coming soon for all of you who are into Mixbus. But, uh, uh, oh, also, a huge disclaimer, everything presented here is not exclusive to Logic. Everything presented here is basically principles and techniques that could be applied and used on any other digital audio orchestration, okay? Because we're discussing music production and mixing, not Logic. Good. Now, coming back to this. Poopy Brown stands for drums, obviously. Even Poopy Brown stands for uh, toms, obviously. Diarrhea poopy looking, uh, yeah, well, that, that color is horrible. Uh, it stands for bass, glorious green, it stands for guitars because green is life, and red it stands for even better guitars, lead guitars. Why? Because red is the color of blood, which is what gives, is the aqua vitae. So, obviously. Now, once we said that, let's spin the track briefly, because if you have been following these last few sessions, you are really sick to death of this song. But let's listen to it. Before Theo says anything, I know, mm -hmm. I mixed and EQ'd the living stuff out of the lead guitar while we were playing back the track. So 
Let me show you what I did. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take you to the, the lead guitar. Here it is. Look, my lead guitar began flat, super, super boring looking. Let me turn off the EQ because that's the only thing that I did. Let me take you back. And why did I did it? Let me explain first. Since we're going to be applying effects and we're going to be using those effects to enhance the sound of the uh, stuff that we are working with, uh, if I, I'm not pleased slash happy slash uh, not pissed off by the sound that I'm uh, applying the effects to, uh, I can work in other fashion. Make sense? Makes sense. Of course, because it's like uh, putting lipstick on a pig. Beautiful expression, I gotta say. Mm -hmm. So, but I have an even better expression, which is I will be throwing more mud to the pigs if I were to just uh, apply uh, effects to something that is not necessarily something correct. So, briefly, uh, the the stuff that I did on my uh, guitar was the following. As you can see on the screen, allegedly, the, yeah, they can see it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, first, I found that the guitar was extremely, extremely, extremely uh, mid rangey and that's great, but it's also bad. Why? Because it's, it was uh, adding a lot of mid-range, but on the not necessarily speaking good uh, frequency range. And of course, the usual suspect 200 something hertz was a wrecking havoc. So I cut off just a tiny bit, not that big of an amount. And uh, also then I compensated and brought back some of the good stuff that was found over this uh, frequency range. Why and how? Experience taste, me being extremely comfortable uh, using my horror tones, my speakers, the, set, the speaker set that we're using here, and let me turn on the other, the turn on the other guys. And it, that's, that allowed me to make decisions based on reality. Why am I, am I able to say such a thing is because I am so used to the sound of my speakers that I know exactly what uh, kind of results I'm going to be getting out of them. Okay. Then I already ruined my mix. Let me fix it. It was somewhere here. And then we got a high, a high cut or low pass, and which I used to remove some of the harshness that was part of the sound, especially after I enhanced the high mids. Just that, okay? Should I apply some uh, compression? I might, but I don't necessarily speaking feel like it today. We will see later on. Now, I might, but more on that later. You'll see. And I actually know that I will, <laughs> okay? But I don't want to spoil the beans. So, first and foremost, yeah, mm. the mix, as it is, sounds bombastic, all over the place, fun, I could say. Do I find it pleasing to the ears? Not necessarily. Why? Because this has been an experiment the entirety of the time, if you have been following this session in particular. We are not doing necessarily speaking stuff uh, that will uh, be uh, to the benefit of the song. We're just experimenting and, and showing you some of the techniques uh, in an overblown fashion. Mm -hmm. But even though we're using and approaching to this in such a way, the sound is not bad, don't you think? No, it, it works. It's, it's delivering when it comes to the, the energy, the, the track feel exciting. It's, of course, not necessarily clean. Clean, yeah, the clean is probably the word that we use because the, um, there's plenty that's kind of uh, overlapping mm -hmm. when it comes to how the, the instruments are over uh, that are interacting together. Yes. But it, it delivers when it comes to the excitement and the, and the feel. Yes, and that's the whole point of this exercise today, Gerson boys. Uh, let me show you briefly the uh, EQ setup of wherever I did on the EQs of this uh, uh, track. Let me show you. Here we got our trusty SSL 360, which is basically speaking just a better way to look at my SSL channel strips, okay? This is going to allow us to see every single one of those guys uh, one by one. Let's, let me... Ish. Ish. <laughs> Gone, thank you. And we can take a look at every single one of those guys in the same spot. And look at this. This is the reason why our mix is kind of muddy. We haven't touched equalizers mm -hmm. <laughs> as a whole. I just uh, briefly kind of clean, clean, cleansed the sound of my guitars before going live, the rhythmic guitars. And then I, when I brought back the electric, the lead guitar, we had to adjust it to taste. But the rest is still uh, wild. That's why we got this not exactly pristine or clean sound, but that's beyond the point. Now, first thing first, 
let's uh, work with our uh, drums. And what we're going to be doing, it's uh, going to be fascinating. Why? Because the first thing that we have to address is going to be the space-time continuum. Okay. Yes. Sounds uh, uh, over uh, the top. Over the top and a little bit too audacious. But the reality is that we are going to be working with a space and time using effects. How? Using re delay and reverb. First, we're going to attack a space. And a space is going to be created by the use of reverbs. I'm going to use the drums first because it's going to be the easiest way for you to see how uh, the use of reverb can be used in several different fashions. So let's address it first. First, I like, this is now my work workflow. I like to hit my uh, indirect microphones, which stands for overheads and mono overhead and everything that is not pointing at a particular a piece of the of the drum kit uh, as individual uh, as uh, I, I refer to those as indirect microphones okay so we're going to be uh, facing in this particular mix with two of those guys we got stereo overheads and mono overheads easy i like to use those guys first as a way to test the waters to how uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, to see how much of the reverb we're going to apply to it we're going to be using reverb for this very reason. We're going to apply reverb first to create a bigger sense of space, to make the drums feel that they are that they are part or they're being recorded inside of a bigger room than they actually were recorded in. Or we can even go further and try to achieve something that it's crazy sounding like the Black Album by Metallica. Yes, you can do that. Of course, it requires a lot of skill and it requires a lot of effort and a lot of time and a few a few thousands of dollars, uh, but it's possible. So let's begin with it. First, we're going to be applying this principle. I'm going to show you my mixer here. And you can see that in this area, you might have to remove my face there. In this area over here, we got my first row of uh, bosses. And if you recall from my other videos on which I explained to you the use of my uh, my template, I have here my orange section, which stands for my parallel compressors. Then we got our blue section, which is where we're going to be working with today at this very point, which is my reverbs. And we got here one, two, three, four, five, six reverbs. Look at that. <laughs> and are we going to be using them all? Yes, we will. And over here we got our delay section, which allow us to use one, two, three, three delays and modulations, which are two particular instances. We're going to be using them all today. So first, let's address the, the first elephant in the room, which is the room itself. We're going to be using this particular plugin. Fantastic, fantastic recreation of a coveted and a super, super respected a reverb unit. Of course, made by Eventide himself. Fantastic. So let's play around with it. First, I'm going to be just uh, randomly sending information to my room uh, 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 channel strip. I don't know if it's visible. It is. It is. Not. <laughs> Let me see why. Oh, oh now, now it is. Thank you very much. Look at this. This is this setup, setup is fantastic. Okay, we're going to be sending some of the information to the room. So please pay attention to the sound of the drums and how they become bigger. Here we go. I'm going to just isolate the sound of the drums, removing guitars on, on its entirety and even bass. Pay attention to how big the drums are going to begin to sound like. Here we go. Interesting, right? It is. It becomes uh, punchier, li livelier, funnier, more exciting. That's yeah. a better term. The snare gained a few inches there. <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, it became beefier, right? Yeah. But it comes with its problems. It's adding a lot of mud. It's starting to make the sound of our mix a little bit more complex 
for our human ears to understand uh, the entirety of the information being presented to us. Presented to us. Let's address it. I'm gonna uh, back off a little bit the amount of reverb being sent to the effect chain because it's a little bit too obnoxious. Uh, so let's play it back again. I'm gonna just for sake of conversation loop back this area, this region over here, so we can actually just uh, keep coming back and forth and. Thank God I muted everything that, but the drums so we won't be annoyed by a repetitive harmony. So I'm going to zoom in again, make sure, making sure that you can see the amount of uh, uh, stuff being sent to the room. Here we go. I always recommend you, when applying a reverb, to let the reverb tell, tell you how long and how effective it is. Because when you are playing back the drums, the reverb is being, it's, it's, it's added to the sound of the drums. So it's, it makes it kind of hard for you to tell how much effect the reverb is having on the overall sound of your drums. So the way I do it is, I play it around for a few seconds, set it to a point in which I think it's been effective, then I stop the playback and I can hear the release tail. That tells me how long the release tail is, first and foremost, and also allows me to see if there is some build up of the low end, which is quite clear that it's happening here. We are going to do it again. Now, so, uh, uh, if yeah. I may, I have a question regarding what you just said. Well, go ahead. Because you mentioned using the, the, the tail of the, of the reverb the determine or let you know if it's been effective or not. Yes. Would the tempo of the song have any, any um, impact on how you would make that decision on how long or how short the, the tail should be? Okay, that's a good question. In theory, it should because the release tail should be, it's going to respond uh, in accord to the consistency and how often every single one of the hits that, that are part of the pattern, the drum pattern, are taking place, because this is a time-based effect. That's in theory. But in theory, we'll know that communism works only in theory. In reality, <laughs> it will fail flat on its face. Why? It's because this is not trying to match the tempo of the song. It's trying to convey the sense and the feel of a particular space. Why? We human beings listen to music, listen to every single sound in the universe as it comes out of the source and it's been reflected in its environment. Why is that? And don't even dare to tell me that what happens if you, if you, if you are exposed to sound in the vacuum of a space. Nothing. You can hear it. Why? You need a medium for the, for the energy, which is sound waves, to reach you, which in this case is air. You need a substance that transfers the energy from one, the source of the sound to your ears. So that's why you, you can, nobody can hear you screaming in space. Great movie, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, since we need a medium for the transportation of the sound waves from the source to us, that also means that we need a particular place for that medium to be stored within. Therefore, a room, a chamber, a cathedral, the planet itself, you get it, right? Yes. So, I wouldn't use the tempo of the song uh, as a way to measure my release tail. I use my, he my ears and my taste, which tends to be quite bad. <laughs> But I try to improve <laughs> upon it. No, now let's take a look because actually that's a good question. Hopefully this will address even more and bring a little bit more, shine more light on it. Let me just make sure that you can see. Yes. I'm going to keep it as it is right now. This is the amount of stuff that I'm sending to my reverb. So please pay attention to how it will affect the sound of the drums. We're going be, to begin without. Here we go.
Could you hear the difference? Yeah. Could you describe it? Um, to me, it felt more... Well, let me see if I can put it in a way that it doesn't sound redundant, because it sounds a little bit bigger. Yeah, but it's super subtle. Yeah, it was subtle, super but it felt subtle. wider. It felt, it felt like that the sound itself occupied more space. Why? Because we're creating the th space itself through the use of the reverb. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, let's take a look at the reverb circuit. Here it is in all its glory. So just a, a quick intermission, Go. just to let the girls and the boys know that one of the reasons why we do this live is so that we can do a back and forth and interact with you. So if anything that we're talking about here, you raise uh, any questions in you or any comments, please feel free to leave, it, leave them in the comment section and we will address it here live. And thanks to Thiago uh, for reminding me that I should have the comments in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, thank God nobody has asked anything yet. Good. So now, Take a look at the reverb circuit. As you can see here, it has plenty of faders. It's already kind of daunting looking. And let me explain this briefly because we're going to be using several different reverbs uh, along the way. Input, how much signal we're feeding the reverb with. Output, how much signal is coming out of the reverb circuit. Volume wise, both of them, okay? Kill, it's gonna help us to stop the reverb in case we uh, have it uh, going for into eternity. More on that later. Then, parameters, parameters. What we got here, it's the wet knob, which stands for how much of the affected signal is gonna be outputted by the signal, it's uh, by the circuit itself. Why is that important? And why do I have it all the way up? It's because we're doing a parallel mixing uh, approach. If you don't know what that means, you can watch last week's uh, session in which we spent the entirety of the session explaining the concept of parallel mixing. This is basically that, but in a nutshell, we're making a copy out of the signal that we're going to be affecting with the reverb uh, and sent into the reverb unit, and it's going to be outputting just the sound of the effect that signal, signal for it to be summed with the rest of the signal itself. And it's going to be fully wet then. Fully wet then. That's what, yeah, exactly. Why is that so important? We can have several problems. One of them, the first one is going to be uh, making the sound of our uh, uh, drums louder or the room microphone louder. Louder. Why? Because we're having an extra version of the, the copy of the sound of the drums, of the room microphone, plus the reverb. That's why you have to make sure that it's just the reverb coming up. This is what is controlling it. So whenever you're doing this trick, the parallel mixing thing, make sure that it's already all the way up to wet. Pre-delay, what does that stand for? It's telling the reverb circuit to wait a set amount of milliseconds seconds before the reverb starts to come out of the circuit. Got it? Mm -hmm. Make sense? It does. Super useful. Why is that? Right now it's set to 4 milliseconds. If I push it to 30 milliseconds, you'll see something funny happen. I'm gonna increase the output just to just for you to hear it. Here we go. Sounds better. Why is that? I hear you ask. Yes. <laughs> it's a really interesting question. If I recall recall correctly, and if uh, I might uh, be there, there's a chance that I might be saying something quite stupid, but here it is. If I recall correctly. It, it takes for our human ears to understand the reflection of a room of certain amount of dimensions, because that's the thing. Rooms vary in sound, in, in sizes. Uh, but there is some form of mathematics going on on which setting a pre-delay of between 25 to 30 milliseconds makes the reverb sound more natural. Okay. Why is that? Science, okay? But not Dr. Fauci's level of science, okay? <laughs> Actual science. Uh, okay, before the railing, you get the point. So, that's one. Now, let's play around with more. Do I prefer it better? Right now, it's working better, being frank. But four milliseconds uh, was also de developing a sound. And here's the deal. Depending on your approach and your objective and the way that you want to mix the song, 
both or even uh, a crazier uh, parameter would be a better solution because this is where the creativity aspect of mixing comes in. We are going to be using, we can use those guys to create something raw, more natural sounding, or to blow it out of proportions and turn it into something, uh, into monstrosity. That's why I used the Black Album by Metallica as a reference point because that album sounds like the Black Album, for real. So, continuing with the uh, uh, parameters, we got the K, which stands for how long the reverb is going to sound like a reverb for, I said amount of time, milliseconds again, actually seconds. This guy is set right now to three seconds, which let's play around with. I'm going to crank it up to a hundred seconds. <laughs> I'm not going to put you through the horrible pain of counting the 100 seconds, but you got the point. Is that useful? Yes. But in this particular take, no. We can do something funny with it. So I will try that fun, that funny thing with this nurse. Not today. Not Yeah, today, but not right now. So let's set it to a point on which it makes sense. This is quite interesting when it comes to decays. The decay will give the impression of the room being bigger or smaller, depending on the amount of decay we set on our parameters. Why do you think does that happen, Stel? Uh Why the decay determines the, the, the size of the room? The size. Because the, the, lo the, the longer, the, well, the further away you are from the, the reflective surfaces, the walls of the room in this case, the longer the decay of the sound will be because it would take more time for the for the time to for the sound to diminish you are a hundred percent correct but what you're describing is the pre-delay not the decay <laughs> and so then what <laughs> the, the, the reason why the decay it, it gives the impression of a bigger room is because it's the bigger the room is the bigger the space is the longer the note will be held by the room Mm. Get it? Yeah, how? Because it's going to be reflecting for several more minutes. Not minutes, but it's going to be reflected several more times because the distance between each of the walls is bigger. Okay. So the note is going to be present uh, 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 around the room for longer. Okay. That's why. In easy, how, how to picture this in an easier fashion? Go to the bathroom. Highly reflective surface, but it's a tiny bathroom. Uh, so you clap and... It sounds like reverb, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you move over to a fancier uh, house and your, your, your bathroom is three times bigger. You clap and it's... Yeah. Why? The space is bigger. It's still the same highly reflective, reflective surface, surfaces. But the size, it's so dramatically big that you got a much bigger interaction between the reflections. Holding the, the note for longer. Works? Make sense? Yeah, but do one thing, because without trying to, to create a can no, of no, worms no, no, go, go. out of something that doesn't necessarily need to be a can go. of worms. But then also materials would come into play. And even I'm not talking necessarily from an objective perspective. I'm talking from a emotional perspective, because yes. for instance, uh, it's not just the size of the space, no. because if you think of clapping in a cathedral or clapping in a library, for instance, yeah. even if they have the same space, uh, they are the same uh, size. size the effect will be completely different. Exactly. Why? Because the library is full of books, allegedly, not uh, magazines uh, with girls uh, so poor that they can't afford clothes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, but uh, all jokes aside, the surfaces, as you mentioned, do play a huge part in the way that a sound uh, it's created. Not created, it's reflected. Okay? Um, that means that uh, the library, since it's covered or it's surrounded or it's filled with objects such as notebooks, books themselves and stuff like that, those materials are extremely absorbent of sound. They are not reflective, if I use a better terminology. Mm -hmm. When compared to a cathedral, which is most of the time comprised of uh, stone, a stone is a really hard surface which has a huge uh, 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 ratio of reflectivity. So. A place such as a bathroom, which is usually uh, 
uh, stuffed with highly reflective materials such as uh, toilets and stuff like that. Uh, even the flooring, I can't remember the name of the of the tiles. The, the tiles. Thank you very much. Uh, those are made out made out of a ceramic uh, element that is super reflective. So that's why you got that uh, particular uh, difference. And why and and how does that impact music production? That's a great question. That's the reason why not everybody wants to go to Abbey Road to record to make a record. The it first thing money. is that the first thing is is, <laughs> is because it's super expensive. And also, uh, well, let's say that you you can pick between Blackbird Studios and uh, 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 the aforementioned Abbey Road. Which one is better? We're talking about super high-end uh, uh, facilities. The difference lies on the sounds that you can create out of those facilities. Even Abbey Road has several different rooms. Each room has its particular sound, and that's why, uh, depending on the production and the producer and wherever uh, he had uh, for a drink last night, uh, he's going to decide which room is going to be the one for the job. So that does that cover? It does. Now, coming back to River Circuit, what if I tell you that you can change the reflective surfaces of the room, not only the size? Okay. Easy. You go here to Program, and you can switch between different algorithms. All of those algorithms will have a completely different way to create the reverberation. Right now, we're using a stereo room. I will keep it as such because we got plate and room. We're going to be using a particular plate river for our plate, uh, the necessities, needs. More on that later. Let's finish off with this guy. Position. This is going to change the way we perceive the reverb sound because it's going to... It's trying to create the illusion of us being in a different point inside of the room. Thus, the reflections are going to be perceived differently by us. Let's see how it, how it operates. I don't know if you could tell that whenever I push it uh, to the R, number R, the sound became a little bit darker. And uh, if I push it to the letter, to number F, it became a little bit less uh, uh, present. Hmm. In my opinion, I prefer it somewhere here. Let's play around with it. Here we go. Now you could see the difference, right? Yeah. I hope you did as well at home. Now, I like what it's doing here, but I don't like how much low end it's been, the build up of low end that it's taking place. Enter the next stage of our EQ and diffusion. It's how clean and how uh, 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 the different reflections are gonna uh, interact with each other. I'm trying to be as, as clear as possible, but let's, we give you a quick example. Right now it's set to 73. And what I like, the way that I like to look at diffusion, because this is a, a, a quite a common uh, a parameter uh, on river circuits of certain caliber. Uh, it makes, it blurs the line between each of the diff each of the reflections in the room, make the, making them sound more natural. Okay, mm -hmm. let's see how it first. Could you hear the difference? Yeah, it felt a little bit more, how can I put it? Not necessarily wider, but it felt, it's actually the opposite, it felt a bit more self-contained mm -hmm. while still delivering the, the, the size, yeah. but a little bit less wild. Yeah, that's no the way to put it. So it's up to you, again, depending on what kind of objective you are chasing in your mix to decide how to use those parameters. And you saw, how dramatic the changes were. And we're still stuck with the first plugin in our chain. Now, the next section, and this is going to be the last uh, thing we address with this plugin. As I said before, I find the lack of, uh, of, of uh, faith in the force uh, when it comes to low end disturbing. <laughs> uh, so what I'm going to do, what if I tell you that this thing comes with a, an EQ? It does come with an EQ, and it's a low cut, 
and a high cut. Look at that. And what we're going to do is we're going to remove a certain amount of low end. And look at this. It's already set to 250 hertz. Who would have thought that that's a problematic region? So let's see. Pay attention to how clean the kick drum is going to begin to sound like. Here we go. Fixed. Well, the difference is quite, quite big. Yeah. So EQs are your friends. So up until this point, are we in agreement that a stereo room, a reverb is great? It's fantastic. Good. Now let's play around with the next stage of our reverb journey. Remember that I showed you several different reverb circuits or several different uh, buses, auxiliary buses that we're going to be using for reverb purposes. Yes, I didn't lie. We're going to be using the next one. But why not do I have do string? Look, this is how I like to look at my reverbs. Remember that we're conveying the sense of an space. Okay, we're trying to develop the the idea of this of this music being performed somewhere. It could be uh, your garage, or it could be uh, in the middle of the space international space station. It's up to you to decide the size, the sound, and the vibe. And we're going to be using different reverb circuits, circuits to uh, develop that particular vibe. The room, I like to see it as the walls. The hall, I like to see it as the ceiling. And the plate, I like to see it as the depth of the room. Each of these different reverb circuits are used for a particular application. Keep that in mind while I mess up with the next stage, which is the hall. Let's take a look. Over here, girls and boys, let me show you. We're going to be using this fantastic uh, plugin made by the fine people at Solid State Logic, which is called Native Flexper. And it's a badass uh, reverb unit. And since I already explained to you how the, the thing operates, you can have an idea already of what kind of controls we're dealing with right now. This guy in particular has a parti uh, something that is quite awesome because you can have two different kind of reverbs circuits, one affecting affecting the early reflections, which is the the first things that happens when the stuff is reflected, or you can have a second one. Well, you do have a second one that controls the release tail. Mm. But that's right. Yeah. And you can blend them both to your heart content. So. Also, we got here pre-delay, which we already know what it does. Diffusion, we already know what it does. Size, self-explanatory. Reverb time, you know what that does. Modulation, we're facing a new stage of uh, parameters. What does modulation do? It's basically chorus, okay? You're just adding a little bit of vibe to the sound of the reverb, okay? Why is that important? This is where we're going to be able to add some flair and some color to the sound of our river. The next stage on this circuit is this fantastic uh, EQ, which you already saw in action in the previous one, and also comes with a compressor here, which is going to allow us to make our sound, the sound of a river, thicker. Thick. Okay. Oh, yeah. Wherever. <laughs> Somebody's... Okay, wherever. We lost that one. <laughs> wherever. I tried. So let's begin adding some thickness. Let me make sure that you can see the zoom. Perfect, you do. Let's now let me make sure that we're gonna be doing this hole to my stereo overheads. Here we go. What do you think? I like it. It was um, exciting, right? Yeah, and it felt more. It gave a little bit more punch. Yes. It made made the, the, the drums feel a little bit more hard hard hitting. Yes. And well, that's always good. It's <laughs> well, always good. Mostly no, always. That's a point. That's a point because drums are meant to be punchy, vibey, dynamic, fun, and engaging. That's how they sound like in real life. And in a recording and in a recording environment, what we're trying to do is to bring as close as possible our listener to the experience of being in front of the band performing. Please uh, stick that into your head. That's extremely important. If you understand that principle, you are going to become a waiver mixer 
like this because every single decision that you're going to be making from that from that point onwards is going to be in the benefit of that principle which is making the experience the closer as possible to the excitement that comes from being in front of Iron Maiden performing one thing that happens with Iron Maiden that, and, and this is going to be kind of a hot take mm. but now it, basically it's everybody I think everybody <laughs> thinks the same way Iron Maiden is way better live than they are in the studio change my mind Yeah, but I think everybody can agree on that. <laughs> yeah. Why does that happen? It's because it's quite hard for the studio to bring that the, the excitement that Iron Maiden develops during the live performances. It's insane. So use that as a reference point. Now, let's coming back to the sound of the reverb. reverb. Let's play around with it. Because with this reverb, we're going to try to push a little bit uh, more uh, the effect to, your, to our faces to make it a little bit larger than life. And Robbie, ha great to have you here. No worries, man. Uh, it's, it's always great to have you on board. So uh, take advantage of you being here because we're going to be here for a while still uh, to ask as many questions as you can. So let's continue. Look, we're going to be dealing with the reverb time. And by the way, Robbie, thank you for uh, giving us the shout out last week. Uh, we fixed the issue thanks to what you said. Thank you for, for helping us with that. So now let's address the uh, big elephant in the room, which is let's make this elephant big enough for the room. So we're gonna be trying out size. Listen to it. And you're already duh. You have two reverbs going at the same time. How can I tell the difference? First and foremost, you should, but I understand why. You need to develop the 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 the, the hearing. So I'm gonna turn off the room. Uh, 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 reverb for now focus on the sound of the of the hole and I'm gonna make the hole even more present I'm gonna crank it up uh, to a stun because this is the experiment so pay attention to how the size and the punch of the room becomes more apparent at the beginning we're gonna have something that sounds bigger and then we're gonna end up in uh, stupidity levels here we go tiny Okay. <laughs> you saw how everything, everything was uh, reacting differently. At the beginning, we got a tiny size, which kind of gave us basically the same, but better. Mm. Why? Because it was adding tiny reflections uh, that was going to the sides of our stereo field, giving us the impression of a much livelier sounding drums. That would be an effect in and of itself. Yeah. I liked it. Then I kept pushing further and further the size and we ended up in a big ass place uh, that sounded gigantic. Would I use that effect? Of course, but in a different way. I know the snare thing is coming. Wait, wait for it. So now let's find to. Uh, 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 let's try to find a sweet spot for this size thing and also I'm gonna push the tail a little bit more because the plan now is to add the this ceiling like uh, concept so let's play around with it here we go call me Phil Collins but <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're starting to get that reverb sound, but this is not uh, the objective of this uh, circuit. I'm gonna back off the amount of reverb, the, the amount of uh, information being sent to our reverb circuit. Let me make sure that you can see, because right now we got it to Unity, and, and it's way, way too obnoxious. Let's do it one by one, little by little, sorry, and let's find the sweet spot. Keep your ears open, and I'm gonna bring back the room because the room is filling the size, the hole is filling the ceiling, and we're gonna add depth in the next station. Let's do it. It's 
Isn't it beautiful? Yeah, it's Isn't awesome. Isn't it beautiful? And look, the even though we're talking about a, a real drum recording here, so it's not like the sound was uh, unreal before. Yes. But as you're adding the, the layers of reverb, it starts to feel more uh, true to life kind of thing. Yes, because we're giving this uh, impression of... Uh, or giving this uh, sense, or I don't know what kind of word could be the best to describe this, uh, but we're giving this uh, the feel and the vibe of a much uh, realistic environment. Mm -hmm. Why is that happening? When you are recording uh, instruments, even though the room it's playing a huge, uh, huge role in the development of the sound that you're recording, we don't. I don't know about you, Tiago, but I don't like to listen to my snares by putting my ear like five centimeters away from the batter head. That sounds like a great way to go deaf in seconds. Yeah, exactly. So, but that's what we do with microphones. And microphones, they also have a particular way of understanding sound. They don't necessarily speaking uh, replicate or capture the sound the same way as we understand it as humans, as human beings. So what we're doing with the reverb is trying to bring back the stuff that was missing while tracking mm -hmm. okay yeah my approach and this is my personal take i tend to flock towards a mix between a raw sound a raw raw sounding uh, jet vibey and polished uh, use of effects particularly speaking reverb some more people like uh, in the 80s are gonna go full on with effects and taking you to places like well, Phil Collins. Think of uh, or the snare found on basically every White Snake album from mm -hmm. the 80s. Bah, bah. There is no way that that at the an snare can sound like that in real life. It's an aesthetic. It's one that works, and it's one that, in principle, it's gonna be fantastic for a track like this. We're gonna again teasing you. But that's super important. I am. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that depending on the material, you have to make the conscious decision. I like to gravitate towards, and you know, you know that I, I always use the sound of Porcupine Tree. Mm -hmm. Gavin Garrison's, uh, his, his, that's his name, uh, is the drummer for that band. Fantastic drummer, one of the best in the business. I happen to be a huge fan of, of the of the way that he develops his sound uh, for the recordings, and especially Steven Wilson, the producer for the band and the owner of the brand, I think, <laughs> uh, uh, he, he has a great taste and I happen to concur with him in his approach to developing drum sound. It's super polished, but extremely natural sounding, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, but that, that comes a lot from the performance as well, especially talking about this particular example. Uh, um, even though I know that he also has quite a lot of input when it comes to the, the production side of things and mixing, the then the, I think most of the sound, even though I know this is a moment to discuss mixing and production, one thing to be taken into consideration, even in the production side of things, yes. is how good the musician, and now in the case the drummer, but it can go for any musician, is in extracting the correct sound exactly. out of the instrument. Yes. Because that can make the producer and mixer's life way easier or way harder as well. Yeah, and actually Rob is making a good point in here as well. Uh, he says that you have to think you have to be careful how far to push the sound when applying these kind of effects. And he's 100% correct. Because if, if, if pushed uh, too much, you create an artificial sound. Is it a bad sound? No, it's just an artificial sound. Does, uh, you, that's why, where you have to add the next question to your uh, train of thought. Is it bringing any form of benefit to my mix? Yes or no? If it's a yes, Push it even harder. Let's see how far you can go with it. If it's a no, it's distracting, it's quite obnoxious, it's quite obvious, back it off. That's the tricky part of developing a sound uh, uh, in, mix, in music production. There is no, nothing is set in stone. Everything is based on the program, the material that you're working with, plus your personal taste, plus the intent behind the song. And since all of those are always uh, uh, varying, it's impossible to follow a, a rule of thumb. Those are just guidelines. And this is the point of this live stream course. I'm trying to, to showcase to you the importance of developing uh, 
the good taste that it's super important for this uh, job, but also uh, the criteria needed and the critical thinking that it's needed to come up to the right conclusions to the problems that you're facing every time that you open up a new session. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's come back to this. I think that my sound is working, but let's see if we can play around with the modulation. I want you to pay attention to the modulation. And also, quick, quickly, see how little I am pushing both of my rivers. Let me just make sure that it's in frame. Look at it. It's basically nothing, but it's making a huge impact. Why is that? We're using taste. And of course, we're using overblown, out of proportions uh, effects. But that's the point. This is the beauty of, of parallel mixing. We can create something stupid, but we can add it little by little onto, until we reach the point on which it makes sense. Badass. Now, modulation. We're going to add a little bit of fluctuation in the tuning of the sound of the reverb. Just the reverb. Here we go. Did you hear that? Yeah. Okay. It also felt a little bit darker when you push it quite a lot. Of course, because we're having this kind of LFO-like, it's actually an LFO, mm -hmm. low frequency oscillator, which is affecting it and uh, the tuning uh, of the reverb circuit a tiny bit, just a tiny bit. Controls, easy to understand. If you have ever used a chorus pedal, that means that you are from the 80s and I like you already. <laughs> also, that means that uh, you have underst an understanding of this uh, of the simple uh, uh, controls on a cross pedal. You got rate, which is how fast the oscillation is going to take place, and how uh, and depth, how intense the oscillation is going to affect the signal. Make sense? Makes sense. Okay. The faster the rate, the the quicker those oscillations are going to take place. The uh, more not the pronounced not not not. You can create artifacts by doing this. The deeper you go, the more pronounced the effect of the modulation will be on the sound that you are affecting. Good combo. I this is how I like to use my chorus spells on my on my guitar. I like to have a huge uh, uh, the depth a little bit higher, but a rate super slow. Why? Because I just want to add a tiny bit of modulation. And I make sure that the modulation is present in the sound by pushing it up when it comes to the depth. But if I go nuts here, we we'll start to create this kind of ring modulation. Mm -hmm. I wonder why it's called like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so in this case, something like this could be better. Let's see. You can feel, not necessarily here, but you can hear the something like this. Now, I'm going to remove the solo button. And please pay attention to how, while I increase the depth of the modulation, we start to get a livelier and vibey sound. Here we go. I like it there. What do you think? Uh, I think maybe you could push it a little bit further. Let me see. Go. Yeah. That sounds better, right? Yeah. Especially here at the tail end. So at this point, I am happy with the results. If I go to the compressor, the compressor is just basically squashing the output of my uh, of my reverb. Why is that useful? We're gonna extend the tail of our uh, reverb a little bit more, and we're gonna compress it and control how the dynamics of the reverb are presented to us. Now this plugin has everything built in. 
you can create your own effects chain using your favorite modulation effect after your reverb and using your favorite equalizer and your favorite compressor in a, sus in a succession. It's not necessarily speaking forced uh, 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 on you, but it's up to you. Okay. I, I like the sound of this guy. It's a really, really effective uh, plugin. I, I love this uh, option of blending the early reflections and, and the release tail using different uh, 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 algorithms. It's a great plugin. And SSL, you have to keep an eye on them because the plugins are expensive, but they are always, every month they are running a huge uh, discount on them. You usually can get them for $29. No joke. But you gotta keep an eye open. So I always recommend you to join those uh, those uh, mailing lists. And yeah, Rob is saying uh, the sound is better, pushed too much, and uh, to me the symbol seems to get harsh. Yeah, they they actually got harsher uh, the more I push the depth because the modulation was affecting the the way those those sounds were presented to us. But it's a total good point. That's why you have to be careful with uh, the amounts. This is like cooking and preparing a good a good steak. You gotta do it. Uh, following the proper timing, you gotta add the, el the, the the elements little by little to taste because following a recipe is, is just guiding you, it's just telling, telling you the amounts, not the moments and how to mix them together. And even the amounts are up to you in the end because these uh, 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 aesthetics are based on reality, therefore we know what beauty is, but what we consider to be beautiful, it's now based on an, on an individual basis. So that's why we got people with more, 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 with more money than taste. Okay, here we go. Now, let's do the goddamn trick on the snare because I've been teasing you for way too long. <laughs> Look, in this particular session, we got two snare sounds. T snare, which stands for top snare. S snare, which stands for sample snare. And if you are eagle light, as I know you are, you can detect that the T snare is mono, sample snare is stereo. Which one are gonna be using for our Phil Collins style of effect? The sample. Why I hear you say? Because the sample is not being affected by the room, and it's also not it, it, it's not been affected by the reverb that we inserted on the room. Does that make sense? It does. Okay, let me see. I got a question here from Bravi. What you could do is push it more and use the insert to, or suit. Yeah, actually, it's not a bad idea. He's still talking about the symbol uh, uh, harshness that was there, was coming up as a, as a result of the use of the reverb. Mm -hmm. uh, the insert is basically a, a comp not a compressor. It's kind of like a compressor. Uh, but it's based on frequencies, rather than uh, rather than a threshold. Oh, okay. So that's why you can tell it to just uh, compress when that particular frequency uh, goes above the threshold. Mm -hmm. That's why they are super effective in controlling the sound. That's why they are called deezers because they are hitting the S's. But that's a good call. Nice trick. Now let's apply this 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 Phil Collins thing. For this particular purpose, I'm gonna be using a different uh, circuit here. I'm gonna be rocking my S verb, which stands for snare verb. Wow, <laughs> brujo. Okay, <laughs> and we're bringing back our old trusty and rusty uh, SP216 reverb. Why? Because I am a sucker for this uh, brand in particular. Tiago knows that I, I happen to like my uh, even tithes. <laughs> A lot. And we're actually rocking a... Look at this! A preset! Oh, are you? Ah, uh, my... Yeah. Heresy! Heresy, I hear you say. Yeah, because uh, you have been following the channel for long enough, you know that I always tell you never to use presets. They suck, but they are good starter points. And we're going to be messing around with this guy. But this particular preset is quite, quite effective. Let, let, let's listen to it. I'm going to solo this there. And we're going to be bringing in the effect little by little. Let me just make sure that I have the control over here. The correct control key. There is. Perfect. Here we go. Badass, right? Yeah. 
So good. What we're looking for with this effect, we're not trying to make, this is once again, the uh, approach that I have in mind for this mix. I can go full on uh, Phil Collins, but I would rather use this to add a little bit more of character to the sample to make it feel thicker thick perfect thank you very much somebody's slipping <laughs> <laughs> thicker but also to make it look look make it look make it sound uh, more natural as you can tell as every sample in the world they are meant to sound like a sample and we're using it as a reinforcement why because we want to be competitive that's why so let's uh, bring back the 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 mixer and let's add to taste the sound of the reverb, the snare reverb, on the sample in context. Pay attention to how thick the sound is gonna get. Thank you. What do you think? I I liked it. To to be honest, I feel that maybe it's a little bit uh, too hard on the reverb, but I don't know how it would go within context. Which leads me to a quick question. Go. Because you always said it says about EQing, never to do it uh, out of context in solo. Yes. Uh, would the approach to to effects be different or the same? Actually, that's a great question. Uh, my take on this is. I like to see what the effect is doing to my sound using solo first, and I show them the show the show the next one, please. Okay, I'm gonna just uh, uh, use one of those extra extra uh, channels or sends that we got here that we haven't used on the on the on the sample. I usually do this. I'm soloing right now. The the sample is soloed, and I let's pretend that we're playing back the track. I will go like this, finding the sweet spot. Okay, I like it. Then I stop the playback, remove the solo, back it off all the way down, playback, but now in context, and add little by little, reaching the point on which I found it to be effective. Mm, okay. Why? Because uh, we're mixing music, we're not mixing instruments. Big difference. Great question. Uh, I found that to be a very effective technique because Especially when dealing with uh, more esoteric sounds, which I will show you and next in the, in, in, with the with the tongue, with the bass, sorry, uh, it could be kind of hard for you to detect if the effect is having actual benefit. It's bringing benefits to the song. Why? Let me show you. How about if I tell you that bass, it's mono. Ooh, what a what a huge and monumental discovery. But what about if I also remind you that we're listening to a stereo mix? What's the point? What if I tell you that you can make your mono bass feel the stereo uh, field better while still retaining the mono compatibility of the bass itself? Sounds like heresy. Heresy, I hear you say. Thank you very much. <laughs> Here is how. And wait, even better. Why if I tell you that the way to do it is by using delay? Oh, for real? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Enter the uh, sketchy territory known as um, Effery. <laughs> because I don't know if we're already... <laughs> you got me, you got me. Okay. So here we go. Effery stands for... Uh, yeah, you know what it stands for. So here is what we do. Over here on my uh, base channel. Super based channel. We got already a set of scents, which if you recall from last session, we used these two guys, the rear and the key SB. K SB. But we got here one that is called it's a slapper. You mean sure. it's a slapper? It's a slap. Okay. <laughs> well, well, you get me. Yeah. Why is it a slapper? Well, we're gonna be using a call a trick called a slap, a slap delay. Not a joke, it's actually it's the actual term. Why is it called as such? Let me explain. 
Delays. What are they, Tiago? They create uh, repetitions of the sound over time. Time. Perfect. Yes, beautiful. and I wasn't even on screen. Yes. Repetitions of the time of the, the sound over time. Yes, thank you very much. That, that was beautiful. Thank you very much. You're a scientist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So if that's the case, what would happen if you make the sound of those repetitions to be super close to the origin point, to be almost matching the exact moment on which you hit the note? I suppose it would thicken up the sound. It will thicken up the sound, allegedly. Yes, you did everything at the same time, but <laughs> I, I, I appreciate the effort. <laughs> yes, it will thicken up the sound. Now, what if I tell you that we can do that, but uh, using a stereo delay? which it's giving us the repetitions on the sides rather than the center. Now you start to see why this trick is going to be effective. And what if I tell you that we can even modulate micro pitch living stuff out of it, of the repetitions, by detuning them a tiny bit, giving us a thicker... Look at that, somebody still is... <laughs> Thank you very much. Thicker <laughs> sound. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry, Robbie. I lost track. I lost. I lost track of the joke that you dropped here, but I can't imagine that it was a good one because you're talking about your last girlfriend. So <laughs> good. I like you even more. So let's uh, get to it. Let me introduce you to the effect that we're going to be using for this particular application. This is a, a replica or a digital recreation of the stereo delay created by ADA, and it's a beast of a mess. This delay is meant to be uh, used to destroy your sounds because it's so messed up, it's so colorful, it's so all over the place that it's just great. Makes sense. And I have it set uh, to drop six repetitions, each of them pan to each of the sides, none of them are going through the center, and uh, they are super modulated and they are all messed up. Listen to it. I'm going to be bringing up the sound of the bass first. Solo. And then I'm going to bring in, and this is the big differential. I don't know if you can see here this. Let me make sure. The slapper, it's actually pre fader, post fader, sorry. So everything we're doing here is affecting the amount of information being sent to the base. And I can see here that we actually kind of did something with it before. When? No, no. Let's uh, do it again because that's the kind of people we are. And what are we going to do is we're going to be bringing in the slapper little by little to taste. Listen to it carefully and you'll see how the bass becomes thicker. Thank you for not doing it. Here we go. The effect is quite not not notorious when I crank it up way too hard. Let's let's clean up the solos. Let's see. Could you feel feel it? No, no, the difference is quite big. The thing, the, the, the bass felt a lot uh, more full-bodied and it was way more present in the mix as well. Could you hear it? Um, what exactly do you mean by that? Do you hear the difference or hear the Could you the hear effect? the effect? You felt the difference. Yes. From what I gathered. Mm -hmm. But you didn't hear the effect. No, no, I couldn't uh, tell, okay, there's a delay on this. Yes, that's the point. That's exactly the point of what we're doing here. When... It, Think of yourself as a magician with K, not with C, <laughs> because you perform magic, not magic. Okay? And what is the first rule of being a magician? You should never reveal the tricks behind what you're doing, because a good magician never reveals his secrets. In this, uh, in this job, that principle applies a lot. Why? When they can see what you're doing, the trick, the veil, the disruption of reality is destroyed. When they can feel what you're doing, you are actually controlling their, your, their minds. You are pulling off the trick correctly. This is not about showing how badass of a delay, a modulated delay uh, effect you developed. 
It's about getting the beautiful girls to dance. And especially speaking, since we're dealing with the rhythmic section of the track, yes, that's your goddamn job. Make sure the girl you like, your babe, and now make sure that she's dancing to whatever you're mixing. If she is, you're doing a great job and you're gonna have fun last, that night. Yeah, if you know what I mean. Uh, and somebody's gonna walk back there, right? <laughs> 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 but uh, whatever, you get the point, you get the point. And you might be thinking, this guy is just cracking jokes. I am partially cracking jokes. I am trying to uh, instill those ideas into your head by uh, giving you visual cues. So whenever you're mixing, uh, you remember uh, the, not what I'm saying, but the principles behind it. What's your point when mixing uh, bass and, and drums? Add group, give this, momentum, dynamics. And group is comprised of rhythm and harmony. That's why those two guys, the drums and the, and the bass, are the happiest married couple ever after Lewis and Clark. The really not, not, not the postmodern versions. Those, I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> but whatever, you get my point. Yeah. So, what I did with the bass, we thickened up the sound, made it feel better in the context of the mix. See what happens if I solo the bass. It's not going to be as fun. We can hear, clearly hear the trick. In context. We barely can. Should I go, le uh, should I go a little bit uh, more conservative? Maybe. Okay, let me, that's, okay, good. I'm gonna address what Rob is saying. It's important to keep in mind that what you're watching on your end, it's being compressed it's been damaged and the audio quality is not uh, as great as it is in here. Also, remember that uh, depending on the quality of your converters and the speaker setup that you got, the, the effects could be a little bit more uh, present uh, on your end. But uh, still, uh, we are making sure that everything I put here is coming out to you, the best quality we, it's allowed to us to broadcast because there is a bandwidth that we cannot trespass and wherever. There are many, many caveats. But what he's saying is real. You could feel the difference. And that's the point. Because even uh, though we're dealing, you are dealing with a very, uh, very compromised version of what I'm doing here uh, in the studio, you are still capable of detecting what I'm doing to the, to the effects and the sound of the music. And let me see, you would also consider duplicating the, the bass track and cut all right frequencies so that yeah you can this this uh, this is a nice trick you can create a sub bass in that in that regard what I, what i would do in that sense would be this let's say that we want to make our kick drum a little bit beefier we are going to do something similar to what rob is suggesting let me show you how because today is more it's all about having fun and uh, fun in the sun we're <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sorry. <laughs> we're going to take a look at my specialized folder uh, plugins and we're going to give it a try to. Uh, where is it? This guy's a badass plugin. Bass Mint by Unfiltered Audio. This thing is insane because what it's basically doing is uh, doing everything that uh, the, this, 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 this technique that is suggested by Robbie. Everything inside of same plugin. Let's listen to it. I'm going to solo the kick. We already kind of EQ'd the kick, so what we're going to be doing is just to add something extra to it. What is it? Let's pretend that we want to turn this into a, a, into a dance track. So let's add some sub frequencies. I'm going to play. Hopefully you you were able to hear because we are I, I I'm actually rocking the sub buffer right now, and uh, we can hear it. Hopefully you could hear the difference here. But uh, what I'm doing with this guy is, I first removed the uh, everything but the effect of the of this guy itself, so I can find the cutoff frequency where I'm gonna enhance the sub uh, frequencies that are part of the sound. Then anti rumble super important, is basically a glorified low cut, making sure that we don't get an extra bump of the nastiness. 
and the cutoff is telling us which frequency we're going to apply the effect to which frequency. And we got the diff several different options. Octave is creating an octave sound, but on a, on a lower register, uh, duplicating or creating a, an octave version of uh, the sound that we're feeding the plugin with. Synthesize. This is going to be fun. Let's see. What it's doing is creating a sine wave that it's adding extra boom. Uh, 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 good, good, good to see that you're, you're able to, see, to hear on your end, probably. It's adding an extra, it's, it's thickening up the sound once again, thick. <laughs> I can't believe that we have used that, that, that guy so many times that we don't want to use it anymore. Yeah, I'm going to leave it for no, now. No, 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 <laughs> thank you, Kev, thank you. So let's keep pushing it harder. Let's see something like this. That sounds cool. Let's remove the solo. Here we go. Mm. What a slapper. What a slapper. Let's bring it into context. Something funny happened. We created a lower volume version of our kick drum. So I'm gonna compensate because we got a cleaner sounding uh, kick drum because of the clarity. The clarity knob in this, in this bad boy is fantastic. It simply works and actually it gives you that sound. The thick, not thick, the, the defined and attacky uh, kick drum. Great for metal, believe it or not. And this guy was developed for <laughs> uh, uh, electronic music, but whatever. But that's right. Is it just me or the bass feels a little bit louder or a little bit more present anyway? It, it feels present because we're cutting up uh, some of the stuff coming from the low end uh, that is part of the sound of the kick drum, uh, cleaning up that uh, register, that, or, or if I put it in a very, in a very, that frequency range, okay? We're cleaning up a little bit more our lower register, which is allowing the bass, which is also part of the lower register, to be detected by our human ears better because there is less clutter. Makes sense? Makes sense. That's why. And why did that happen? Well, the circuit, we are uh, cleaning up the, the attack by uh, playing around with this area here, uh, but also we are adding a little bit of the renowned Genesis Equa to the frequency that is the most fundamental frequency of our kick drum, which is 80 hertz. That's why. Now, Let's take you to the let, let me take you to the final stage of this uh, uh, session because even though we're having fun, uh, we are already overboard. But I want to finish <laughs> off this session because I'm sick of this song. We're gonna bring back the gloriousness of guitars. First, what are we gonna do with it? This is a very badass trick that I learned. Uh, 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 just by messing around? No, I didn't. I actually uh, learned this from De Pensado. And uh, this is a great trick that is not even developed by him because it was used by Eddie Van Halen himself. And it's based on the concept of adding a super chorusy sounding guitar, uh, parallel mixing uh, guitar, uh, to the core of the sound of the guitar in an attempt to do what? Thicken up the sound. We're going to make it wider. And as you can see here, I briefly attacked this, uh, this concept before because the plan is to make the sound of our guitars wider in a scope. See how this works. I'm going to first solo the guitars. I'm going to back off the entirety of my wide uh, system and see what happens once I push it further. Here we go. You could hear that when I pushed the fader somewhere here, the effect was present. But 
if I back it off, it became thicker sounding. No, no, don't use it, please. <laughs> it's, it's too much of a good thing. <laughs> but uh, it also became wider sounding, much more broader. Let's see it in action. Bring it the rest of the mix. So good, so good. Hopefully it's translating the same way it, it, it's translating over here, but it's fantastic. Now, it's all fun and games when we're dealing with a, a, a micro pitch. Of course, it's always fun, but the guitars are super dry. Why is that? We need to add reverb to them. Let's do it. Over here, you can see that we got the same suspects as before. We're talking about the room, the hole, and the plate. We haven't touched the plate yet. We're going to do it with the guitars. No, we're going to do it with the with the uh, with the drums. But let me finish with the guitars. You already know what the room uh, sound is. You already know what the hole sound is. Let's add them to taste to the sound of the guitars. And this is when you do it in context. Let me make sure that I got yes. We're going to be sending first the hole. No, the room. Here we go. Oof! Of course, the release tail is stupid, but who cares? <laughs> we are gonna listen to the track with everything inbound. Pay attention to the sound of the guitars and not the guitars alone. Listen to everything, because this is when you stop thinking in terms of instruments and you begin thinking in terms of music. See how it's gonna feel first, without the reverbs. Okay, but now with the river. Freaking Death Leopard! <laughs> We're getting into that vibe. And why it's important? Well, it's simply because we're dealing with a song that it's kind of hard rock in spirit. And that's part of the aesthetics of a hard rock band big stadium sound pushing the reverb hard enough allow us to give the sense of uh, gigantism <laughs> to the mix makes sense right makes sense yeah by that now speaking of gigantism i don't know where you're going with this <laughs> <laughs> let's play around with plate reverb we're gonna be using the badass super plate and uh, this is where we're gonna add depth to our mix. Pay attention to the drums. I'm gonna solo the drums again. How could you describe this stupid sound? Now this was bombastic and bombastic, over the top. Bombastic, but you can feel this, right? Like, yeah. It's not brr or brr, it's brr. Very clear description. Yeah. <laughs> Proper <laughs> terminology, <laughs> professional terminology. No, but actually this is important because this played reverb is a completely different sound than, uh, than the room or the hall or the chamber or the cathedral, okay? And uh, we have to understand that each of these uh, uh, circuits is there to cover a particular uh, role, to do a particular thing. That's why I keep pushing this idea. We're using the plate to convey this. We use the room to convey this. We use the hole to convey. Okay? Beautiful, I know. <laughs> so, now let's play around with this guy because I think we got uh, a little bit too dark to my taste, so I'm gonna lower, uh, uh, cut a good chunk of the low low end, add modulation, because why not? Uh, pretty delay, as it is, and we're gonna make it shorter, because it's way too deep, let's see.
You know, I just realized that we need the meme uh, with Kanye West. Which one? No, the Drake meme. Oh, uh, yeah. And then, yeah, that, we need that one. Okay, okay yeah. But, I'll procure. Yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> Priorities. But what do you think? The sound is badass, right? Yeah. Pretty good. Why? Because now we have a full space uh, surrounding our drum sound. And what if I tell you that we're just doing this to the stereo overheads? You are meant to do that to everything, but to different degrees and to different amounts. Uh, so you can create a much better sound. Now let's play around with our final effect, which is going to be delay. And we got two different options. We're going to do the delay thing on our glorious lead guitar sound. Let's listen to it first. Dry as a bone. It has a tiny bit of delay, which is part of the recording, which is always useful. Uh, but I want the delay to be a little bit more present in the in the mix. So as usual, we're gonna mix in context. So let's pick a, let's first set the synth to the proper uh, circuit. We're gonna be using S delay, which stands for stereo delay, and we're gonna use my trusty Echo Boy. Why? Because that's we're gonna be using two two, two delays. You see, first one. Let's play around with this guy. We're gonna use this uh, for uh, thickening up the sound. We're gonna be doing the slapper thing again. So let's make our echo super fast. And uh, no, we're gonna keep the fill and the swing uh, as close to the pocket as possible. We're gonna go for dual echo. And we're gonna make it super fast both, but one slightly slower than the other. Let's see what happens. Solo the guitar solo. Interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Now let's increase the feedback. And you might be able to detect that we're turning our uh, uh, delay into a reverb. Okay, interesting. It is a reverb now. Why? Because reverbs are basically super fast delays. No, no joke, for real. Okay. That's what they do with the diffusion thing. That's why I was trying to explain to you the what the diffusion thing does. It's just making sure that the repetitions, the reflections, are not as clearly uh, hearable or listenable or well, detectable uh, uh, as they would. And we are turning this into a super short reverb that is allowing us to give the sense of uh, space. It's no longer dry. Let's see what happens if I back it off and add it little by little to taste. You just make sure that I have control over it. Yes, here we go. So good, right? Yes, yeah, quite cool. So cool. So cool. Now our guitar sound feels like it belongs to the mix. That's the point. Final stage. Now let's add vibe. We're going to bring in the bad boy. The H3000. All right. Going fancy. And this, traditionally speaking, is meant to be used only by presets. Why? Because it's a mess to program. And uh, since we're already a half an hour overboard, <laughs> we're going to stick to that tradition. So let me see if yeah, everything is visible. We're going to be sending our uh, thing, our guitar, little by little. So pay attention to the sound, because I'm going to be sending the guitar, and we're going to be uh, switching around the effects here. This is what we got now. As you can see, this is a super fast uh, setting. Why? Because this is what I use uh, when I am dealing with a, a vocals mix. 
where, where, there are vocal, where, where there are vocals to increase the width of the sound of the vocals. But this time around, I don't want to do that. I want to go nuts. Let's go for delays. Give me slinky. Let's see. Okay, that's way too good for jazz. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's see another one. Uh, short echo. Nice, but it's basically what we're doing with the echo boy. So we need something better, man. Pitch and delay, exactly. Uh, Phantom double, no, 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 no. Dream delay, sounds like fun. <laughs> Way too fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now let's do something a little bit less uh, modulated. Reverb. Delay. Before you shoot the arrows, this is gonna work. How? Easy. We're gonna do it to taste and in a sensical fashion. In context. Fantastic, somehow, right? Somehow it did work. <laughs> of course it worked. It's even tight, man. <laughs> of course it will work. But why is it working? It's because we are not making the effect present. We are capitalizing on the fact that each repetition is slightly detuned and going to hell uh, <laughs> as each sequential repetition pops up, making the sound coming out of the speakers uh, feel fuller and we are adding harmonic content. Beautiful. That's why. No, for real. The reason why it's working is because we're making the sound richer in information. Mm -hmm. But the information that it pertain, pertains to the stuff that we're listening to is actually beneficial. This is exactly what I meant. It's not about making your tricks present. It's about making your tricks be effective in conveying an emotion. Mm -hmm. Got it? Yep. So there you have it, Gerson boys. Somehow we ended up with a mix that is not terrible, <laughs> <laughs> even though the whole plan behind it was to have fun and do stuff that, not necessarily speaking, I would do in a regular mix. Uh, not in the sense of the tricks that I showed you. I actually do all of those tricks. That's why I managed to pull them off. Uh, but uh, I went overboard on mo most of them because the whole objective of this uh, session was to provide you with a good uh, reference point and give you some ideas that are a little bit outside of the box uh, that actually make a huge difference when it comes to mixing music. So hopefully uh, it makes sense to you and you found this particular session useful. Thank you very much for joining, and of course, if you like to support this channel, the best way to do it is by listening to music on Apple Music or Spotify, and also by following us on social media, such as Instagram, because that's the best way for you to get in touch with us in a much more personal basis. How? Allegedly. Exactly. So, <laughs> okay, that was actually badass. So, uh, as every single time we meet you with some boys, we gotta remind you something. Never, ever, ever let anybody tell you what to dream about. And remember that we will see you, both of us, Allegedly, let me see. We will see you when we see you. Bye. <laughs>